and let's pray. Lord Jesus, what a day that will be when you return for your own, when faith is turned to sight, we get to be in your very presence, not able to sin, not able to be displeasing to you in any way, able to love and communicate with fullness of righteousness. Until that day, we are so thankful to be credited with your righteousness. We're so thankful to have the gospel through faith, by your grace, declaring over us a status we could never earn, never merit in all of our hopeless, vain attempts. And so we relish your grace and we rest in your love as those loved by you. We ask that you'd help us this morning to understand your word, to be convicted by it, to be convinced by it, to love you more as a result. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 10. We're continuing where we left off last week. Our goal was to get through verses 5 through 10. And this morning we'll pick up in the middle in verse 8. DIY stands for do it yourself. You can DIY just about anything these days. You can even turn DIY into a verb, like I just did. The DIY project promises to save you significant money over buying a manufactured product or hiring a professional for a home project. And when it comes to home renovations, Pinterest boards, helpful tips from the friendly folks at the neighborhood big box hardware store, and of course, Chip and Joanna Gaines, have all conspired against us, convincing us mortals that we really can DIY the impossible. In our home in Nashville, I attempted a bathroom remodel, went down to the local big box hardware store with those happy people ready to give tips, and they had a whole new stack of this great new fantastic plumbing material that did not require sweating copper did not require 90 degree angles and a spaghetti of welded plumbing behind the walls, but just simply snap it in, glue it, it goes around corners. I thought, man, this stuff is great. And, and the guy there who was standing in, in front of this new product told me what glue to use, and I went home happy as a lark that I didn't have to set myself on fire trying to weld copper. I learned about the DIY disaster. At about three o'clock in the morning, with the pipes in, the wall up, and the sound of rushing water. Instantly awake, adrenaline rushing, eyes wide open, trying to remember where was that shut off valve. Had to dismantle the whole thing and start over and not use that fancy new product. By the way, when I went back to the hardware store to ask questions about the product, they weren't carrying it anymore. <laughs> And the person who helped me didn't work there anymore. If radio ads and TV shows are any indication, I'm not alone. And there's a radio ad playing in the Phoenix area right now for a professional repairman who specializes in fixing DIY projects gone wrong. <laughs> and apparently there's a TV show called DIY Disasters where you can watch homeowners attempt to do it themselves, resulting in the destruction of a home or personal injury, and lots of wasted money. Well, you need to know that law righteousness is the ultimate DIY disaster. Attempting to merit for yourself a righteousness that God would accept is worse than any home project gone awry. It has eternal consequences because the only righteousness that God will accept is the, righteous, that, the righteousness that he demands and the righteousness that he provides as a free gift by grace through the finished work of his son, Jesus Christ, at the cross. And there is no other way to get to heaven. Every other path, every other attempt 
is a disaster of eternal and infinite proportions. And that is where we find ourselves in Romans 10. Paul is putting a contrast before us between law righteousness, the DIY self-merit of human religion and human achievement, over and against faith righteousness. And I want us to read again Romans 10, 1 through 10, to set our context this morning. God writes through the Apostle Paul, Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. Paul is speaking about his kinsmen, Israelites. I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness, and listen to this, seeking to establish their own. They did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on law shall live by that righteousness. But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? What does faith righteousness say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. These verses appear on nearly every gospel tract that has gone out, and for good reason. I want to unpack these verses for us this morning because there is much more here than meets the eye, especially when we see it in its context. In contrast to law righteousness, which we looked at last week, and we discovered there that with law righteousness, salvation is impossible. Salvation is impossible. If, if we're looking at these two paths that diverge in the middle of life, a path called law righteousness and a path called faith righteousness, if you go down the path called law righteousness, salvation is impossible. However, if we go down that other path, the path we're looking at this morning, the path of faith righteousness, we discover that salvation is not just possible, but guaranteed. With faith righteousness, salvation is guaranteed. And we're going to see a number of phases of how that guarantee comes. First of all, grace comes near through good news proclaimed. On this path of faith righteousness, grace comes near. And we find this in verse 8. What does it say? What does faith righteousness say? It doesn't say what we looked at last week in verses 6 and 7. But faith righteousness says... The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. And here Paul quotes from Deuteronomy 30. Again, he's appealing to Moses to appeal for grace and faith righteousness from the very documents that those who counted in law righteousness might look to to bolster up their own merit. Jews, legalists, Judaizers, those who were opposed to Paul's preaching of the gospel would look to the law of Moses as if they could keep it and as if it was designed to grant them an access to a righteousness they needed to be right with God or to live in the land and prosper. And Paul uses Moses' words to demonstrate that nothing could be farther from the truth. And, and he does that in verses 6 and 7 in quoting various aspects of the law. Here in Deuteronomy 30, verse 14 Moses says, but the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may observe it. These are the words that Paul quotes in Romans 10, 8. And it's said in that context of Deuteronomy 30, we looked at it last week, that is a new covenant context where God had commanded the Israelites in Deuteronomy 10, circumcise your hearts. That impossible command of you Israelites need to do a surgical work spiritually in the inner man such that your heart and its affections and its desires and motivations are oriented towards God. You need to do that, Israelites. And they could no more do that than Nicodemus could be born again by his own doing. 
This is an impossible command, and yet it is a command that God loves to meet. In Deuteronomy 30, he comes around and says, I will circumcise your hearts. And in this very context, these words come. We looked at these last week down in verse 11. This commandment which I command you today is not too difficult. It's not out of reach. It's not in heaven that you should say, I have to go up and get it. It's not across the sea that I should go over there and get it. But where is it? Verse 14, it is near. It's in your mouth and in your heart. And what do we find God saying here? That that God's grace, his self-revelation, is right there for his people whom he rescued out of Egyptian slavery. He wants them to know him. He wants to be known by them. He wants them to know him. He wants to grant them the greatest treasure available, himself. What a gracious invitation to put on display his characters and his ways, his character and his ways, to graciously give them an avenue for blessing and prosperity, to reveal to them his expectations and to make himself accessible to his people. And these very sentiments are what Paul is appealing to in Romans chapter 10 as he quotes Deuteronomy chapter 30. This nearness of God by his grace is precisely what is offered in Romans 10. Notice how Paul says this. What does faith righteousness say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is, and and he clarifies exactly what word he is talking about. This word we are preaching. The word of faith which we are preaching. It's right here. This word of faith is an unusual phrase for Paul. Here he simply means the gospel. It's actually unusual for Paul to use the Greek word rhema for the gospel, but he's picking up the term here from the quote in Deuteronomy 30. And it's clear that he means the good news of the gospel because he's contrasting the good news of faith righteousness over and against law righteousness. And he'll make that more clear as he walks through verses 9 and 10. We see that this path of faith righteousness guarantees salvation. And specifically, salvation is secured through self-abandonment. This salvation that is guaranteed by faith righteousness is secured through abandonment of self. That's what verses 9 and 10 are all about. This is about abandoning yourself as the practice of faith, which is the vehicle by which salvation comes. Listen to Paul's words. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Paul appeals to confession And belief. And what he's talking about here is the abandonment of self rule and the abandonment of self righteousness. I don't know if you've ever had to abandon ship. I've heard that is a terrifying prospect, one that makes you leery of being on ships afterwards. Do you remember the scene in Acts 27? 276 people are on a sailing vessel. That seems like a lot of people for an ancient ship to me. And and Paul is on that ship, and a Roman centurion is on that ship, and a bunch of other prisoners. Paul is on his way to Rome. By God's providence, he's going to get there. And God has promised to keep everyone else on the ship safe as well. You remember there is a wild storm, so much so that in the, the midst of darkness and despair, everybody on the ship went 14 days without food. They threw everything off the boat. They were in the end hopeless. And yet Paul clung to the promise that God had made him. They were finally run aground on a reef and the back end of the boat, the stern of the ship, if you will, was being battered and broken up by the waves. And the Roman centurion on board the ship called abandoned ship. Everybody in the water, swim if you can, otherwise float on planks or anything else out of the ship. The call here in Romans 10 is for you to abandon you if there is any hope of salvation. In Acts 27, everybody was saved. Everybody made it to the beach. And you will be saved if you abandon you. That is the call of Romans 10, 9, and 10. I want you to see this. Romans 10, 9, and 10, by the way, do not portray for us a two-step program. 
Um, in other words, you have to confess, number one, and then you have to believe. And if somehow you get struck by lightning between the confession and the belief, tough. And, and we know that that's not a two-step program, that in fact, those are two sides of the same thing. Those are in fact, two ways of expressing genuine saving faith that God produces in the heart that makes its way out. These are both two sides of this faith righteousness uh, that comes, and, and, and it's expressed as confessing and believing, confessing Jesus as Lord and believing that God raised him from the dead. These two things go together, and we know that they're not sequential. In other words, you have to do one thing, then the other, and we know that for three reasons. The first reason is that the order gets flipped in verses 9 and 10. Confess and believe, and then believe and confess. And number two, Paul is picking up the word order in verse 9 from what he just quoted in Deuteronomy 30, right? So you don't want to press, well, the first thing you have to do is, he's talking not sequence, but just concepts. And then the real sequential order happens in verse 10, where the heart believes and then the mouth confesses. We know that out of the mouth, the heart speaks. It is the, the heart that happens, and that comes out outwardly through the mouth. That is the real logical and sequential order. Well, what does it mean to confess, first of all, Jesus as Lord? The word confess means to solemnly declare something, and, and often cases, to solemnly declare loyalty or to profess allegiance to someone or something. It's not so much that uh, the idea is to confess that something, like a content of information, but to confess Jesus as the Lord. To confess him is to publicly, solemnly profess my allegiance and loyalty to Jesus Christ. And this confession of Christ came with risk and a cost. Robert Haldane said this, if a man does not confess Christ at hazard of life and property and liberty and everything dear to him, he has not the faith of Christ. The confession of Christ that's described here is the kind of confession that we just sang. <laughs> I want Christ and you can take the whole world. Take everything. I want Christ. Christ. That's the confession we're talking about here. This is what Jesus described in Matthew 10, 32. Everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. This is a declaration of ownership, of fealty, of loyalty to Jesus Christ. And this confession of, was the confession of early Christians. And what they were confessing is that Jesus Christ is in fact the Lord. If you confess Jesus as Lord. Now the word Lord in the Old Testament was used over 6,000 times for God, for Yahweh. And, and when, the, when the translation of the Old Testament was taken from Hebrew into Greek, the Greek word kurios was used to translate Yahweh 6,000 times. And although the word Lord or kurios can be used in normal human relationships, can be used of, of a person who's of higher rank or status than you, someone who's a boss or, or a person of nobility, when you say, my Lord, please excuse me, that can be speaking of just human relationships of one higher than another. The Lord simply means one who has authority over another. It means being in charge. And the word is used in the Bible to describe various human relationships, a king, subject, a master, a servant. But it is used most often to describe God himself. But the phrase that's used here is not my Lord or a Lord, but the Lord. Now, this is unique. Over and over again, especially after the resurrection, this title, the Lord, became almost exclusively used in the New Testament of Jesus Christ. And in many places, when Yahweh was referred to in the Old Testament, it was applied in the New Testament to Jesus. That is a staggering claim of the deity of Jesus Christ. It happens in this very chapter. Look down at Romans 10, 13. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. In context, he's talking about Jesus. And yet it's a quote from Joel 
And it is very clearly Yahweh in Joel 2.32. The New Testament has no problem ascribing uh, titles and passages and attributes and activities of Yahweh to the person of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Of Jesus in the New Testament, this word Lord, the Lord, is used over 700 times. Just by way of contrast, the word Savior, the title Savior is used of Jesus 10 times. It's not that one is necessarily more or less important than the other, but you see the weight ascribed in the New Testament to this title for Jesus. It is beyond argument that Jesus is the Lord. He's Lord of creation, Lord of the universe, Lord of the distant pulsars and quasars at the edge of our perception. He's Lord of every subatomic particle and every single thing around us. There's nothing that escapes his authority, nothing that can circumvent his power. All belong to him. Jesus is in charge. John 1.3 makes it clear. All things came into being through him, that is Jesus, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Colossians 1.16, by him all things were created and all things hold together. Hebrews 1, Jesus upholds all things by the word of his power. In Philippians 3.21, Jesus has power to subject all things to himself. He is the Lord. And at the end of time, every knee will bow and every tongue will indeed confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Christians confess now what everyone will be forced to confess then. Simply acknowledging the incomparable position that Jesus Christ has in the universe is not what leads to salvation, however. James 2.19, we know that the demons know who he is, and they shudder. They don't have saving faith. The demons acknowledge who God is, but theirs is not a personal commitment to live under his rule. Confessing Jesus' lordship here is a matter of surrender. It reflects a desire to let Jesus be in charge personally, as well as universally. It's a surrender of the will. It is an abandonment of self-rule. The person who comes to Jesus Christ in faith says, in effect, I surrender that whole I'm in charge thing. You give up trying to run your life your way. You humbly acknowledge that you need someone else to be in the driver's seat. And listen, we sinners don't naturally like that part. I think most people, if you told them that they could have a get out of hell free card, but they didn't have to surrender their lives to Jesus or even like him very much, they just might take it. And when you and I proclaim the gospel to people, there's usually a hang up on this issue. Jesus himself faced it many times in his earthly ministry when he called for the radical kind of commitment that demonstrated a desire to surrender the will or when he called for people to love him above all other loves people walked away. But you who know Jesus, you know something profound. (laughs) Surrendering to Jesus' lordship is good. It's a good thing. Consider Jesus for a moment and think about what it means for a finite and dependent human to place his or her life into the care of Jesus. He's the creator, the sustainer, He is unswervingly committed to the glory of God. He is omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. He knows everything. He is all-powerful, and he's everywhere all the time. And with all of those attributes, Jesus loves his sheep, his people, such that nothing, Romans 8, 38 and 39, could ever separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. A master committed to love his servants with that kind of love is unlike anything we can compare in human relationships. Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you. I'll come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be there also. Jesus is committed to that. John 17, 2, he has authority from the Father over all flesh so that the ones the Father has given to him, Jesus gives them eternal life. John 17, 3, Jesus defines eternal life as knowing him, the greatest treasure of all. And Jesus has secured these things for his own by his own blood. What love, what power, 
And when that love and power are combined, we see that Jesus Christ is radically committed with all of his attributes, with all of his resources, with all of his care and compassion to the eternal and infinite good of every sinner that comes to him in faith for the glory of the triune God. And that commitment cannot be altered, cannot be superseded, cannot be removed. Contrast that for a moment by the thought of surrendering your life to someone else, a human being, not omniscient, not omnipotent, not committed to your infinite good. Even if the person were well-meaning, they would lack the power necessary to ensure those intended outcomes. But surrendering to Jesus is good. Paul says that confessing Jesus as Lord results in salvation. Listen, you have to abandon self-rule. You have to give up. And Jesus will give you everything. (laughs) There's a second part of this faith righteousness. It is the abandonment of self-righteousness. Faith righteousness abandons self-rule, and it also abandons self-righteousness. We see this again in verses 9 and 10. This is the second phrase in verse 9. If you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What does this mean? Recall from last week what we looked at in verses 6 and 7. There's a negative statement there. Faith righteousness is personified and commands us, don't say this. And what do verses 6 and 7 say? Don't try to get up to heaven to bring Christ down. You can't get up there. You, You don't belong there. You're a sinner. God's holy. Even if you could recognize that you need a Savior, you can't go up there and get one. You cannot accomplish the impossible. You did not make the incarnation happen. That is God coming to earth in human flesh in the person of Jesus. God alone did that. And when Jesus was born in a feeding trough in a barn in an obscure village to an unknown family, you didn't think of that. You didn't bring that about. You didn't accomplish that. You never would have dreamed of it. The humiliation of God in the birth of Jesus, that was God's doing. The point of verse 6 is you can't go up to heaven and provide yourself a savior. And don't try to go down into the grave to bring Christ up. In other words, you could not accomplish the incarnation and you certainly cannot accomplish the resurrection. You didn't bring Jesus out of the tomb. God did that. And when Jesus went to the cross, taking on all the sins of everyone who would ever believe, he suffered the infinite wrath of the Father against all of that sin. He bore our sin in his body on the tree. And when Jesus Christ conquered death, And he walked out of his own grave. He demonstrated that his death on the cross was sufficient to actually satisfy God's wrath against all the sin of everyone who is his. Infinite anger is quenched by an infinite sacrifice. Perfect justice satisfied by a sufficient substitute. And death could not hold him down because the price had been completely paid. His resurrection proves our justification And you can't do that. You can't absorb infinite holy wrath. You can't satisfy divine justice. Not all the good works of a million men in a million years, not all the church going of all the faithful of all time, law righteousness only brings judgment. Faith righteousness brings the impossible. It lets God do the work that only he can do. And so here's that positive statement in verse 8, that salvation is right here, it's near. A relationship to God and rescue from his wrath are readily available. If faith righteousness does not attempt the impossible, provide a savior and produce your own justification, faith righteousness rejoices in the nearness of God by grace. And that's the context for Romans 10, 9. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. We might try to read the verse this way. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And there, that emphasis would, would press for us the importance of sincerity, right? We might read it this way. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And that emphasis would, would place the, the point of the passage on the reality of the resurrection. And listen, sincerity of belief and the reality of the resurrection are critical, critical to our faith. 
But that is not what the context demands here. I believe that the verse should be read this way. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And we get that from the contrast, right? Faith righteousness doesn't say, uh, verse 8, verse 7, who will descend in the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. Faith righteousness does not say, how can I bring about my justification? How can I accomplish the resurrection? No, faith righteousness says, God raised him from the dead. This is all about God's work to bring about salvation. Not you raised Christ from the dead. Listen, we must sincerely believe in the historical fact that God raised Jesus from the dead. That is, God accomplished the work of salvation. What was required for our forgiveness, what is required for our eternal life, has been done by God and by God alone. And it is imparted to us by faith. It is a faith righteousness rather than a law righteousness that gets us to heaven. To believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead is to abandon self-righteousness, to abandon self-justification. It is to run away from you, to abandon ship on the disaster of a self-merited atonement. It's to abandon everything you can do to merit God's favor. It is to give up trying to accomplish your own salvation and to trust only in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. I want you to look for a moment at Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55 is another song of Israel given by Israel's prophet that is this gracious invitation from God to come and have as a free gift what he offers and what we desperately need. Isaiah 55, beginning in verse 1, ho, which is attention-getting, Yo might be a modern translation. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good, and delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Verse six, seek Yahweh while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to Yahweh, and he will have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares Yahweh. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. What a fantastic invitation. Where God says, come, you don't have any money, and buy from me all that I want to give. What, what is the point of that? You, you work, you earn wages, and what do you spend them on? Garbage. Garbage that doesn't satisfy. The point of saying you have no money is not to say you don't have any money. It's that your money is worthless in the register of what God demands. And what you can't afford with the currency that you have, God gives as a free gift. Access to him by faith, not with what you do, but by embracing his glorious and gracious invitation. This is the same invitation we have in Romans 10. Look there, Romans 10, verse 10. Paul continues the idea with some mirrored thoughts. He says, for with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Notice how he says this. Confession unto salvation, belief unto righteousness. And again, verse 10 switches the order from verse 9. 
The idea is that belief in the heart brings about a confession in the mouth. Uh, The confession hasn't changed. The content of belief hasn't changed. But here they're flip-flopped and the results of salvation and righteousness are used as near synonyms. And Paul does that on purpose. The heart believes resulting in righteousness. This is the righteousness promised in the gospel. This is the very theme of the book of Romans, Romans 1.16. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because in it, the righteousness of God is made known. Righteousness as a free gift made known, manifested, provided for in the gospel. That's why Paul's not ashamed of it. Because the very thing that people need, that we can't provide, that only God can give, that God demands, is given as a free gift in the gospel. And so the heart believes and the result is righteousness. This very righteousness the whole book of Romans is about. And the mouth confesses resulting in salvation. And and again, free gift righteousness and salvation are talking about the same reality. And they're closely linked because belief and confession are closely related in this passage. Listen, you cannot believe and not confess and still be saved. Right, if you believe but don't confess, Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32, I will not confess you before my Father. It's not true faith. To, to, to think you assent to something mentally, but your boast before men is not, I have Christ and you can take everything else. This is not true faith. It's a spurious faith. And you can't confess without genuine heart belief. Right, a, an outward confession, an outward profession is just nominal Christianity. It's hypocrisy, it's empty, it's void of the truth. It's not saving faith. And so genuine belief and an outward confession go hand in hand. They're two sides of the same reality that God produces in the heart. And when a believer confesses, he is putting outwardly what, ha- what God has already wrought in the heart because Christianity is not a private issue. You may have run into people that have said, oh, uh, me and the Lord, that's just a private thing. I don't have to be outward and really showy about all of that. It's not a private issue. You cannot receive God's perfect righteousness by faith and not be saved. The idea that these things would be separate realities that you get righteousness, but you don't get saved. That, that's not a reality. Nor can you be saved without that perfect righteousness. Salvation and righteousness go together, just like confession and faith go together. They are parallel, and they are near synonyms here. Paul, again, in Romans 10, is still addressing the problem of Israel. The problem of an entire nation of people who overwhelmingly rejected Messiah who believed that they would get into a right standing with God simply because of who they were, their ethnic status, who their parents were, their lineage by birthright. And Paul grieved over the truth that they were hellbound. I want you to hear Paul's own testimony because his compassion for Israel in their rejection of the gospel is not some distant, disinterested, oh, those poor people. It is, in fact, his own story. Look at Philippians chapter 3. Paul lived DIY righteousness. He knew in his heart he was good enough. He was gooder than everybody else. If anybody was going to get in, Paul was in his mind. And when Christ intercepted him on the road to Damascus, Paul abandoned ship. Listen, Philippians 3, 4. I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more And then listen to Paul's pedigree. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, 
as to the righteousness which is in the law? How did Paul measure up in his own mind or even in the minds of his countrymen or the Jews who looked up to him? How did he measure up in terms of law righteousness? Blameless. Of course, not before God, before men. Verse seven. But whatever things were gained to me, And the pedigree that Paul just listed was gain to him, pre-Christ. It was the pinnacle of what any Jew could hope to achieve by law righteousness. He says, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. All his status, all his reputation before men, his career path, all of it. I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them but rubbish. That's a kind way to say what Paul describes with that word. I count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ, and I may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I might attain to the resurrection from the dead. What is Paul's own testimony? Abandoned DIY righteousness and deadly self-rule and totally entrust yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Abandon self. This is what faith righteousness does and you cannot get to heaven without it. We sang these words a few moments ago. Take the world, but give me Jesus. All its joys are but a name, but his love abides forever through eternal years the same. Take the world, but give me Jesus, sweetest comfort of my soul. With my Savior watching o'er me, I can sing though billows roll. Take the world, but give me Jesus. In his cross, my trust shall be till with clearer, brighter vision, face to face, my Lord, I see. And then the refrain, take this world, my God, is enough. Matt, is it possible for the crew to sing that one again? We can do that. Maybe we'll close with that. Let's close in prayer. Lord Jesus, you are the Christ and wrapped up in your name and titles, the Lord Jesus Christ, we have exactly what we've looked at this morning, that you are Lord in charge of all and that you are Christ, the Messiah, the hoped for one, the only one who could come and take on human flesh bear our sin and purchase for us eternal life. You are Lord of the universe and you are our Lord and our only hope. Lord, you have produced in us a heart of faith we could never come up with. Even the desire to sing a song like this, to give up what we cannot keep, to gain what we cannot lose, unthinkable naturally. And yet the fruit and the result of your spirit's work in our hearts. We praise you for these things and we sing now for your glory. Amen.